He used to say of Patrick Henry that he would throw himself in at the beginning of a sentence, trusting in God Almighty to get him out at the end. <laughs> Bill is a man of faith. <laughs> no, actually, that's wonderful to see. Thank you. Well, we've come down now to the really the last in the series that has to do with sort of systematic presentation. Um, and tonight we're talking about the healing of the soul. It's one of the hardest uh, topics to talk about. Uh, there's been a kind of resurgence of interest in the soul and, a, and a, in terms of publishing, there are all kinds of books now on the soul. It's really quite hard to understand and get it in place practically. Practically. Uh, and yet, it's absolutely essential. The great uh, passage in Deuteronomy 6 that uh, Jesus picks up you all know this. I mean, this is the great Shema, Hear, O Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. And you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And um, now when we sing, uh, I surrender all, that's, that's what it's talking about. It's, it's being willing to come to the point to where with every essential aspect of your being, you love God. Now Jesus did a little modification to that in Mark 12, because as you may recall there, he adds some dimensions that are important. He doesn't leave out any of those, but in response to an inquiring uh, person who was asking what is the great commandment uh, Jesus says well uh, hear O Israel the Lord our God is one Lord and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength and I think it is very important that we get added in here Deanoius mind, and the mind is the area of thoughts and feelings. And then he doesn't stop there, but he pulls out of, I think it's Leviticus 18, the further commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. Now actually, those go together, and the teaching of the New Testament about love makes it clear that you can't love God unless you love your neighbor. And actually, you can't love your neighbor unless you love God. Just look at your neighbor. <laughs> right? See, you have to love God to have the wisdom and the strength to love your neighbor. Because you have to put that neighbor in a larger context. Right? And uh, that's extremely important uh, for us to understand. And we want this love to come right down to the level of our body because that's where we live with our neighbor, is in our body. And so let's kind of keep the continuity from last time and just remember uh, that we want, to, we want the body to be set to spontaneously be loving and that means that in our relationships to others around us that we are free of those two modes of attack and withdrawal you remember those see that want to be free of those and uh, I ask you to think about 1st Corinthians 13 because that really does uh, bring to fullness I mean there isn't anything in world literature that comes close to the teaching about love in the New Testament and uh, the capstone is really what Paul says about it there. I hope you had a chance to meditate on that and to see the emphasis that Paul had learned from his fellowship with Jesus Christ and with those that Christ were redeeming 
and uh, we might just meditate a little bit on that wording. And uh, if you want to look at it, you can. I'll just paraphrase some of it. But you remember that Paul says, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels. Sometimes we don't remember, but rhetoric or oratory was one of the greatest things in antiquity. Uh, and to be able to speak well uh, was, uh, was thought to be one of the greatest attainments in human life. And people employed people who could just, as we say, roll the rhetoric to be there at special occasions and roll it, you know. But of course it could be so empty. And that's what Paul is saying. If I can speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not agape love, I am become a gong show. <laughs> See, sounding brass is a gong. That's what that's, what that's referring to, is a gong. And tinkling cymbals or clashing cymbals, just a lot of noise. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries, though I have all knowledge, though I have all faith, so that I can move mountains and have not love, I am nothing. I'm zilch. And though I um, bestow all my goods to feed the poor. You know, you could do that without love. Yes, you could. Yeah. And give my body to be burned and have not love. It doesn't profit me anything. And then he begins to go on to the, really the heart of love. Love suffers long. Why did he think of patience the first thing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Love suffers long and is kind. Love doesn't envy, doesn't exalt itself, isn't puffed up, doesn't do really stupid things. Um, I think that's one way of putting that. Doth, doth not behave itself unseemly. Doesn't do really stupid things. Doesn't seek its own. Is not easily provoked. I guess that means it can be provoked. It's just not easy to provoke it. Right? Doesn't dwell on bad stuff. Thinketh no evil. Doesn't rejoice in iniquity. But rejoices in truth. Bears all things. Believes all things hopes all things, endures all things. Love never quits, never quits. Now remember, this is something we are, we don't do. This is something love does. And what we do is we receive love. And that, now all of the parts, remember my circle, all those parts, then that's love the Lord, your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus actually tells us what that last phrase means when he says, this is a new command I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. See, he, what it means to love your neighbor is redefined by Jesus. Greater love has no man than this, that he should lay down his life for his friends. Right. I don't think that just means dying. Sometimes it would be easier to die for someone than live. Right? Get it over with. <laughs> so that's, from the human point of view, it might be easier to just die for him. Leave them here to take care of themselves. <laughs> well, you see, we have to be careful with all of this now. We want our bodies to be involved in that. And our bodies are very important now. Because in our body is given a certain natural ability to step into goodness. 
And as far as it's a natural ability, it's flesh. And you see a lot of that coming on now. I don't know if you saw the uh, recent edition of Time magazine that featured meditation. Just a discussion of what happens if you do certain things with your body, and that's all true. But there's got to be a lot more to it than that. Jane got an email from somebody this last week and uh, on the subject of mental health and stress management. She said, just in case you've had a rough day, here is a stress management technique recommended by all the latest psycho psychological texts. The funny thing is it really works. Picture yourself near a stream. Birds are softly chirping in the cool mountain air. No one but you knows your secret place. You're in total seclusion from the hectic place called the world. The soothing sound of gentle waterfall fills the air with a cascade of serenity. The water is crystal clear. You can easily make out the person you're holding underwater. So, you know, we really do need a little help. We need to recognize the importance of the body from a natural point of view. But then you see, when we, when we move into spiritual disciplines with our body, we're moving beyond the flesh into union with Christ. And what the body can do is important because that's where we can make a move. And we have to move. And as I've said over and over in the series, what we're talking about here, healing, holiness, power, this is not passive. And we have to learn how to move. And we do it with our body. Uh, in chapter 15 of William Law's wonderful old book, A Serious Call to a Devout and Holy Life, he has some wonderful words about this. And actually what, he, what he's talking about here is uh, singing psalms when you don't feel like it. And he's talking about how God has made us so that our bodies and souls are joined together. And that by doing things with our bodies, we can actually open up avenues for power and strength in our souls. And uh, just read a word or two here from this chapter 15 of this wonderful old book. Now, therefore, you may plainly see the reason and necessity of singing psalms. It is because outward actions are necessary to support inward tempers. And therefore, the outward act of joy is necessary to raise and support the inward joy of the mind. See, that's when we talk about putting off the old person, putting on the new person, we're talking about doing something. And it's a very interesting thing that all of the disciplines for the spiritual life are bodily behaviors. Even memorization of scripture. And now why is that? We'll go back to last week's study now. And remember, what is our body? It's our little power pack. Okay. God has given us our body as a place to exercise our kingdom. And of course its point is to submit it to God. But we're given the option of not doing that, and that's where we get in trouble. And um, the teaching here of law, he, can, he says also, for since we are neither all soul nor all body, seeing none of our actions are either separately of the soul or separately of the body, seeing we have no habits but such as are produced by the actions of both our souls and our bodies, it is certain that if we would arrive at habits of devotion or delight in God, we must not only meditate and exercise our souls, but we must practice and exercise our bodies to all such outward actions are, as are conformable to these inward tempers. See, that's what we have to learn, to train the body uh, really, to use the body, it's a God-given principle that we can use it to bring ourselves closer to God. And uh, what you do with your body makes a difference. Um, just think about a simple thing like skipping. Uh, most of you look to me like you've given up skipping. <laughs> 
but maybe you'd like to try it tonight in the dark on your way home. And what you will realize is it makes a tremendous difference, right? Skipping, just something simple like that, you see. And that's why it really does matter what we do with our bodies when we pray. It really does. And you need to experiment with that and learn the difference that it makes. Now, it isn't because it earns you anything. It's because you're an embodied being. Right? You're an embodied being. And so you have to learn how to take care of and use that body to submit your members to God in righteousness. And uh, last time I gave you a verse uh, about it is vain to s s rise up early and sit up late and eat the bread of sorrow. And some of you looked at me a little strange about that. So I thought I'd better give you the right reference on it, which is Psalms 127. And we, we use the first verses here. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman keep, keeping awake is in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early and retire late to eat the bread of sorrow of painful labor. For he gives to his beloved sleep. Sleep is one of the greatest acts of faith. You, you heard about the lady who said that when she went to bed at night, she turned the world over to the Lord because he was going to be awake anyway. <laughs> mm. But some of us can't do that. See. And to be able to sleep is a great act of trust towards God. So our body is very important, and we want to, we want to bring it into this area uh, of love. And we want our bodies in its social relations to be in a position of loving without special effort. Now it takes us a while to get there, you see. And we have to train ourselves uh, so that love naturally flows. And uh, what we have to stop and think about is one of the things that shows us where we are spiritually. And what we spontaneously do also shows us where we are spiritually. So now let's think about love and work our way into the soul here. But remember now, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And when you look at that verse, I mean, think about what that would be like for us to be in that position. And think the thought, this is something for us. This is for us. That means we can do this. It's possible for you to, to do that. Now, you know, I'm not going to argue about whether you're going to get all the way there until you're dead and on the other side. Uh, we just want to remember that we can do a lot better than we're doing. See? And maybe you can't go all the way, but you can make significant progress. And that's what we want to think about. Well, now what is love? Love is will to good for all concerned in our presence and our action. That is to say, when we love, we have goodwill. We are thinking about doing good to those that are affected by our actions. Note, love is not a feeling. We talked about that earlier. It has feelings with it. And they're good feelings. But we don't focus on that. That's a consequence. That's not the heart of the matter. That's very important to understand. Uh, because love is a set of the will. First it comes from God in Christ. That's how we, we learn it. And I've given you two passages there. And I won't take time to work through them now. But I hope you're familiar with them. And uh, the great passage in Romans 8 is about how nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ. It talks about how God has, has loved us. 
And uh, then John 1, uh, 4, 9 says simply, we love God because he first loved us. Uh, the truth is, from where we're coming, in a broken world, broken people in a broken world, we really don't know what love is. And that's why in the culture, it is such a mess. And it and does so much harm, hurts so many people because of the confusion. See, if love in this sense were what governed our relationships in our families and beyond, then of course the world would be transformed beyond recognition. But too often, love is confused with desire. And love is not desire. See, I say I love chocolate cake, but I don't. I want to eat it. <laughs> I am not interested in it's good at all. <laughs> and love and desire are two different things. Now, if we were put together in the right way, then we would desire what is good. But the trouble is that we often desire things that are not good. And consequently, our love does not function rightly. Because our will is enslaved to things that we desire and not to what is good. And now, go back through the notes and the, remember what we said about the mind and all of that. Because if our mind isn't set full of the goodness of God, then we will be enslaved to our desires because we will think, I can't do what is good, because if I do, I won't get what I want. And it's only confidence in God that enables us to say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And to say that whatever the circumstances may be. So that's the process that we go through. God loves us, then love is from God, and the one who loves is born of God and knows God. Now that's a really, so you have to remember the standard of love. Because certainly it isn't true that the one who lusts is born of God. That isn't true. The one who loves is born of God because that's the only source of love. And the center of the universe is a wonderful community of persons that is characterized by love. God is love. Hmm? So we grow to love God with all our heart. Now, um, kingdom living is living by the grace of God that comes from God acting in our lives in a loving way. And we know this grace by venturing on God. That means, among other things, that now then when I'm faced with a choice, I won't just say, what do I want? I will say, what is good? And when the voice comes back and says, yes, if you do what is good, then you'll not get what you want. Right? Then I say, aha, there is a God. There is a God. And uh, that, that's the great testimony out of the book of Daniel, you know. There is a God in heaven. So, well, I'll throw you in the furnace. Okay. We don't need to have a committee meeting about this and think about it. You just go right ahead. See, that was their confidence. Daniel also. There is a God in heaven. I'll pray to him and he'll reveal to me the meaning of the dream. See, there is a God. So the first words of the old creed, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. See, that's foundational to loving. And then by imitating God, I love this passage from Ephesians, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Isn't that a, isn't that a nice phrase? A fragrant aroma. God, Christ giving himself up in love. Now you know that aroma has filled the whole earth. 
Sometimes it's kind of blotted out, but it's there. Jesus put his mark on the earth when he was lifted up on the cross, and that was an act of love. He gave him, no one took, no one made him do that. He did that out of love. He did it to reach you and me and everyone in the world. And it's a fragrant aroma. What's the, it's the aroma of love. So transformation of character then and expressions of power will go hand in hand as that grace moves. Signs and wonders are a natural expression of the presence of the kingdom. It's a natural expression of the presence of the kingdom. See, one of the interesting things when you study the Gospels and the book of Acts is what happened without people even trying to do it. You remember the little woman who came and just touched the hem of Jesus' garment. Well, see, that's because his body was functioning right. It was full of power. And then you see that same thing with the apostles later on. And it does happen still. Uh, some of you will remember Catherine Kuhlman. And uh, people started being healed without her doing anything in her Bible classes. She's just teaching the Bible. See, so let me just restate that. Signs and wonders as we speak of them are a natural expression of the presence of the kingdom of God. And that is a kingdom of love and grace and we should expect that and our bodies should be in a position to convey that kind of power. And it's a wonderful way to do that in uh, rituals uh, like uh, my friend Trevor Hudson down in uh, South Africa was used to have in his churches Thursday night, I think once a month, they would have the Lord's Supper and they had a prayer team and uh, people who wanted ministry for health uh, would come. And then in that setting, he would, and there are many ways of doing it. You don't have to knock them over like Benny Hinn does, you know. I mean, there are many ways of doing this. But we have to understand the presence of the kingdom has that as a natural expression. And then love will lead us to pray for people and to speak against what is evil and to speak what is good. And we do that in the name of Jesus. That's the main thing, really, they were learning in the book of Acts, was to act in the name of Jesus. So you go back and look at all those little passages and see how they use that name. Now, see, when you use the name, you are invoking the kingdom. You're acting in the name of the king. So now that, that may be a challenge to some of you. I know it won't to others. Uh, but this is just something you experimentally follow up on. See, as, you're, as you grow in character and love increasingly possesses your life, you will naturally want to give the gift of the kingdom to other people in speaking and in action and just in your presence. Really, the, the, primary, uh, the primary means of evangelization in the world is the bodies of disciples. It's what is there, what's flowing out from them. And uh, once you come with your mind and your will and your, your body and your soul and your social relationships and all of that is functioning as it was meant to function, then the world will change uh, around you. Now the core of kingdom living is the surrendered will. And I have to talk about that before I go on to the soul, and I will get there in just a minute. But I said I think the other, uh, a few weeks ago, the will or the heart or the spirit is the executive center of the self. That's where you make your choices. And it is fundamental to everything. Because it is what God looks at more than anything else. It is the set of our will. And a surrendered will to God 
is at the very heart of progression towards wholeness. And if that will is not surrendered, then the rest of it won't come along. And what that means is, what I want is not what I live for. And um, do not pass this. You can't. Because if you pass this, the rest of it won't work. I don't live for myself. And this is what Jesus was talking about when he talked about um, taking the cross. It has to be a settled thing. I do not live for what I want. It's okay for me to want what I, I don't deny what I want, but it does not rule me. And that's what it means to have a surrendered will. A will surrendered to God. And I, at the center of my being now, I've settled that. Good under God rules me. That's what I live for. Now Paul, going back to our lesson from last time, puts this in very bodily terms. He says, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, but present yourself to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. And remember our discussion of last time about the sin that is in my members. Well, see, I, put, I give my members to God. And, and it's actually often very helpful for you to just very explicitly do that. Find a quiet place and time and prepare yourself for it and spend significant time. Just lie down on the floor and give your body to God. Say, Lord, you have my hands, you have my tongue. And go just all that's yours. Surrender them up. And now that's helpful then in using your members in righteousness wherever you are. You don't be afraid to do that. You can give your body to God. Actually, he bought it anyway. He made it anyway. You don't own your body. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. So give it up. Turn it over to God. And then you're ready to, as Paul says, die daily. Paul was describing a situation actually where any day he could have been dead. <laughs> you know. So when he got up in the morning and walked out to carry out his ministry... It was like accepting death. Now, that's a very literal sense of it. But of course, we also want to understand that if we think we're not about to be killed today, uh, we still want to be dead to self-will. Not dead to will. No one's dead to will. Will's not bad. Will's good. The harm comes when it is turned on itself and say, now what do I want? I want what I want when I want it, as the song says, right? And no, so I don't live that way. Now, if so, suppose I want some raisin bran for breakfast. Well, that's okay. That's not self-will. Self-will is like when I say, I'd better have some raisin bran for breakfast, you know, fee fi fo fum. <laughs> And, yeah, no, that's, see, that's different. Now, the surrendered will then works itself out. Uh, it doesn't mean gritted teeth. See, that uh, also we want to remember. To this, we're looking for the executive center of the self to bring every aspect of the being around so that when we do love our neighbor as ourselves, it isn't like, mm, 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 mm. <laughs> it's easy. And I, I think that's the most important thing for us to understand in all this teaching is, we're talking about the easy life. The hard life is the other way. This is the easy way. Now, it's not easy, it's impossible if you don't take the inward route, then it's impossible. And gritted teeth won't help for very long. So the surrendered will turns all dimensions of the person, mind, body, and so on, to love of God and to love what God loves. And so then again, our old illustration, you think about bless those who curse you, well, that's the easy way. 
That's the, that's the easy way. But you have to have stabilized your mind in your vision of God. The feelings that are governing your life must be those that go with love, joy, peace, faith, hope, and so on. And then it's easy. Does that make sense to you? Because you see, that's the heart of the teaching. Uh, we're talking about actually coming to the place where we just do the things that Jesus said and we uh, can all be summed up in terms of loving God and our neighbor in the way Jesus described it. Uh, but it isn't an outward thing. It's an inward thing. And we can do it by the grace of God if we go by the inward route. And we can't even do it by the grace of God if we go the outward route because the grace of God will not cooperate with us. And that is what Jesus means when he says you have to go beyond the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees or you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Not talking about going to heaven when you die. It's talking about living in interactive relationship with what God is doing now. It's Matthew 5.20, right? Unless you go beyond. Now what is the righteousness of scribes and Pharisees? It's at the level of action. So what he's saying is, don't just try to do the right thing. Don't just try not to do the wrong thing. That's where the scribe and the Pharisee is. The ambition of the Pharisee is to say, I didn't do anything wrong. And then in order to meet that, they had to cut it down. And that's what you see in any system of legalism. You take a religious group, and I won't mention anyone because I don't want to be hard on any of the groups, but just look at any of the groups and look at the degree of legalism that is involved. And what you will suddenly realize is that, well, I'll just say most of them, so anyone who wants to can make an exception of themselves in such a group. Um, uh, see, when you look at most of them, what you will see is that they have defined this so that it leaves out the heart of love. And they define their righteousness in certain ways um, that will enable them to negotiate it while remaining fundamentally unchanged. And that's where we get our, our host of mean, unhappy Christians. And uh, there's so many of them. It's because they've not gone to the inside. See, they haven't changed the inside. And they find it impossible to deal with the outside. Blessing those who curse you is something you can learn to do. And now our last session, which is next week, um, perhaps uh, I want to talk about the practicalities of learning to do specific things. And maybe you'll want to bring a special commandment that you think is real hard and then we'll try to talk about how you would learn to do that. Because they're all doable. They're all doable if you don't fall into the legalist trap. So spiritual formation in Christ-likeness is not just a matter of changing the will itself, but the whole person. And so now the soul. Uh, the real problem is how to describe the soul. And... Let's begin just by saying the soul is the deepest part of you. Uh, it is actually, for the most part, beyond your conscious awareness. Um, you have a kind of sense of it. And uh, you sense it as a kind of stream of life flowing in you. And sometimes it's pretty weak. Um, sometimes it's stronger. Um, sometimes we speak to the soul in the second person. You'll notice that in the Bible. In the Psalms, why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for you shall yet praise him for the health of his countenance. See, you talk to the soul. The rich farmer, soul, you have much goods laid up many years. Take your rest, right? And uh, so that's the deepest. Jesus said, what would a man give in exchange for his soul? He's referring to the deepest part of the self which if you lose that, your whole life is out of control. And in thinking about the last days, Jesus said, in your patience, possess ye your souls. 
It's talking about the end time when life isn't going to be like it is now. Um, hard times. But he says to those who have faith in him, in your patience, possess your souls. Uh, actually, if you don't have patience, you're not going to possess your soul very well <laughs> in any circumstance. And patience requires faith that God is in charge. And that what I want doesn't have to be done. It requires humility and a lot of other things that go together. Uh, and if you have that, then you're able to possess your soul. Poets also speak in this way. They speak to the soul as if it were a sort of something over here. A second person. You don't have direct control over your soul. You can't, that's your will. And next is your body. And... Um, your mind and your feelings as you learn to use your body, but your soul simply isn't under your direct control. Your soul is like that about you which enables you to have control at all, if you have it. And it's so important to understand that it interfaces with reality, that it inter interfaces with God. The soul is meant to find its home and its rest in God. Right? And its contact with God is what keeps it alive and keeps it strong. Then on the other hand, the soul is what brings all dimensions of the self together to form one life. So in a person whose soul is not broken, the feelings and the thoughts and the bodily behavior and the social interactions are all congruent. You understand what I mean? They're, they're consistent. And that's just the opposite of the situation that Paul presents, you remember, in Galatians 5 as well as Romans 7, the things that I would that I do not. Things I would not, I wind up doing. See, that's, that's a result of a non-functional soul. Now, there are all kinds of degrees of that. But basically, uh, what you see in a person whose soul has been restored is the capacity to consistently and simply do the good things which they propose to do and to not do the evil things that they propose to avoid. And that goes all the way from adultery to Twinkies. Okay. So now we have a real problem in our, con in our country, and not just in our country. I was, but Newsweek this week, I think, was talking about how it's, now it's coming to Asia, of just eating too much. And uh, I don't, certainly don't mean to get after anyone about that here. Uh, so don't worry about it. Um, uh, but there's, it's a problem. It's a health problem. And it's a, you might think it would be a simple thing to just say, well, I won't eat that much. But it isn't. And a lot of that is geared into our social system. So it's not just the body, it's the social setting. It's just like, oh, you know, Peter in that case where he's denying Christ. The social setting and the body is what... And the broken soul can't, can't make those come out whole. One would think it would be a simple thing to say, well, like smoking, for example. Oh, I just won't smoke. But if you've tried it when you've been addicted, and I can't really speak for it because I, I was never addicted. When I was a child, I picked up some cigarettes on the side of the road and smoked them. And I think I threw up for three days. <laughs> <laughs> so that just took care of me. <laughs> but both of my brothers, so they, I remember my older brother, who's now gone to heaven, uh, he used to, we were very poor, and I, uh, he would stop smoking long enough to buy his daughters new shoes. And then he'd make a beeline for the Lucky Strikes. Lucky Strikes means fine tobacco. <laughs> remember that? <laughs> L-S-M-F-T. See, I know, I know all those things. So now, um, the broken life is, and the broken soul, that's what we're really talking about in this series. And this is the common uh, kind of an experience. Uh, we, 
we have lost souls or dead souls. And uh, when the will withdraws from God and focuses upon itself, the soul is deprived of sustenance in God. And it withers up, it dries up. And it, it's unable to make the connections like between a decision. I hate this smoking and, well, okay, I just won't smoke. It would seem like a simple thing. My drug of choice is caffeine. But I will not be enslaved to it. I mean, there's a good use for it and a lot of bad uses. So what we, whatever, food's the same way. Food's wonderful. Uh, but you don't want to be a slave to it. And we can escape that as we progressively nourish our soul in God more and more and learn to lose ourselves in love of God. Now, when that soul is broken, then that's what leads to so much duplicity in human life. Deceit, falsehood. Um, and carries all the dimensions of the self with it. Body language, social relations. All of that is corrupted by duplicity and deceit. And transparency is lost. And, where you, and you really can't have love without transparency. You have to have that. You have to have transparency. Or you can't have love. And that's why communication is so important. Because transparency doesn't just happen. Uh, it happens as you willfully use communication in a way that is not misleading and not deceitful. Uh, and you can do that because you trust God and you don't have to manage the world on your own. Now, the duplicity and the deceitfulness brings you to the place to where you don't really know where you are. And that's what a lost person is. A lost person is a person who does not know where they are. It isn't someone who doesn't know where they're going. It's someone who doesn't know where they are. If you don't know where you are and someone hands you a map, you can't use it. See? So you have to know where you are. And if you've lived in the duplicity of human relationships long enough, you're so confused, you, you have no idea where you stand. And it's only as God pulls us into clarity that we begin to know where we are because now we can claim where we are as the gift of God. We can begin to say, I am me. I am here. These are the people around me. This is what we're doing. And all of a sudden things begin to become clearer. You're not denying who you are. You're not denying who other people are. You're not denying what your work is. Not in behalf of dreams about what you wish you were or others were or what your work is. See, this, this is really fundamental, folks, uh, in, in getting out of brokenness. Uh, this is where we begin to be able to do what is morally good, to devote ourselves effectively to the good we want to do in life. See, every, every individual has on them a personal call from God to be the light of the world where they are. Now, I know Jesus is the light of the world, but he doesn't let you off the hook that easy. He says, you're the light of the world. And you can only be the light of the world where you are. And that really means you have to get out of all of this duplicity. Uh, and uh, you have to begin to find a source of nourishment for yourself where you are. And say, it's okay for me to be here. It's okay for me to be who I am. It's all right that I had the family that I have, that I was born in the time I was, that I have the gender that I have, that I have the education that I have, and so forth. Wow, I know that's, that's not easy to say. That's not easy to say, because if we want to focus on it, we can just fill our life full of regrets and recriminations and all the things that weren't right. And if we do that, then we will never be able to say, as I said the other night, it's so important to be able to say, God has done well by me. So you have this picture now in the scripture 
the tragic picture of human life. Matthew 9, 36. Such a touching place. Jesus is he's early in his ministry. He's looking out at the people. And, and uh, the language there is very, uh, very graphic. It says his heart was torn. Heart was torn. The language that's used is like you would use if a, if a an, an wild animal tore you. It says his heart was torn. As he looked at the people, he says, because they fainted and were scattered abroad like sheep without a shepherd. And sheep without a shepherd really do get scattered abroad. You know the, the Old Testament passage in 50, Isaiah 53, all we like sheep have gone astray. How do sheep go astray? One nibble at a time. <laughs> That's the way they go astray. And after a while, they're just all over the place. They have no idea how they got there, how they're going to get home. They have to have a shepherd. One nibble at a time. That's how sheep go astray. Jesus looked out at his people. They fainted and were scattered abroad like sheep having a shepherd. Matthew eleven twenty eight. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Um, this wonderful passage here in Isaiah 61, which could be the um, passage for the whole series. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives, and freedom to the prisoners, and proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. That is to say that right now is the time that you can know God's favor.